it's scary because the the suicide rate for black boys and men and we've talked about this multiple times yeah has increased exponentially exponentially over the last 10 years and nobody's like okay well yeah this is happening but nobody's really like panicking and i'm like y'all don't think this is a, a bigger or major issue than what we're making it out to be you know and so I think that's why, and, and nobody was really, I've been doing this work with black men probably since 2018, 2019, maybe 2017, but, um, you know, and it, nobody was talking about it. Nobody was having a conversation about it. It's business as usual. And then uh, outside of the mental aspect, there's the physical aspect. Brothers are dying earlier and earlier in life. Physical health conditions, mental health conditions, you know, physical and medical conditions. And we got to get, you know, I, I, I'm a black man. I have black male friends, right? I'm raising a black boy. I want to make sure that, you know, we are healthy. Flow up. All right, cool. I'm going to start here mm -hmm. with these. I pulled these out. Today, yesterday, mm -hmm. it's 09 Jordan Cherry 12. So the Cherry 12s came out in October in 2023. Yeah, and so these are my 09 pair. So okay. this is a, and they haven't been clean in a while. So I said, you said pick a pick a Grail pair, pick a daily mm -hmm. pair. Mm -hmm. So let's go with these. So are these the Grails or the dailies? Grails. These are okay. Grails. These what are makes what makes a Grail a Grail pair? That's specific to the person. Mm -hmm. Um, everybody has a different opinion on that. I believe, personally, mm -hmm. it's whatever you feel like is a favorite shoe of yours and it gives you some type of moment in time, right? Okay. Terry 12s, I remember one of my first pair of 12s I had in fifth grade, being a fan of Mike, and then also, um, you know, just watching him, you know, ball in these jumps. And these always look super nice on court with the Bulls jerseys, man. So I was so happy to have it. I had these in the Taxi 12s, which continue to evade me. Nike needs to retro these. Nike needs to retro these. Um, but you don't think Nike has retroed enough at this point? They have. They're doing a little too much, but they need to retro the ones that we want to see. How does retroing a sneaker water down the market or the storyline of that sneaker? Water it down, you said? Mm-hmm. I don't think it waters it down. It still tells a story depending on who's seeing it. But... Again, this depends on who's the collector, right? Is it OG sneakerheads who've been in the game for 20 some 30 years? Is it new people getting introduced to these things? It, 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 it depends on the person. Um, the only thing I would say is sometimes retroing, if we changing up the quality and stuff like that, or some of the colors is a little bit off, stuff like that, then it's not going to look, it messes up the storyline, I would say, in that aspect, but it still tells the same story. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I think. But um, these are a little dirty, too, actually. Now, usually what I would do, I've seen everybody cleaning the shoes and doing their different things with, and I love seeing the opportunity and creativity, but I want to come in and talk about it because I think that um, cleaning your shoes is also a very therapeutic process, um, and it's very meticulous. And so if I had my... If I had everything I had needed to, I would have these strings in a uh, cup of some bleach and a little Dawn, throw them in there, soak them, and then you would just scrub them together, get that dirt up off them, that's it. You don't need to do no high profile chemicals with all that, but you know, shoes shoe, shoes have got a little out of control now, so I ain't got enough time like I used to to be able to be so meticulous. That's why I'm so happy to do this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So. What's the importance of your time? Many things. Time, peace, happiness, joy, reflect on life. It's precious. It's been coming up a little bit more in conversation a little bit more for me. Just thinking about my time, and I think I'm looking at my time as far as the other half of my life, mm -hmm. where I'm going, and what I wanted to be, what my what my kids to see, what type of time I want to spend with them, all that type of stuff. So, 
But time is very important to me. I don't think I'm gonna get that piece off right there. When it comes to your relationships with your children, mm -hmm. do you see yourself instilling the love for sneakers in them? Or do you give them an opportunity to pick and choose who they would like to be? If they want to. I'm not pushing it on them. I mean, they expensive. <laughs> so I can only push it so much on them. But, you know, I think my collection that I have... My, my daughter sees it. She's open to it. She She's asked me for some pair of Jordans and shit that I have in my closet, but I said, you can't, I ain't got these ones for you. Um, but if she wants to get into it, sure. Same thing with my son. When he gets older, he'll have access to them because I'll keep them all, you know. And my wife has a little sneaker collection too, so my, wife, my daughter can tap into that collection as well, but I'll be gladly pass that on to her if they want. But my thing about it from parenting wise is I don't, I don't want to force them into stuff that daddy has done. Be your own person, be your own self. Do what you want to do. You know, and I'll support regardless. Um, but I'm very, very, very. Ugh. I don't want to impose on my child, children to be who they want to be. You know? And there's some concern too, I think. You know, about like being overachieving and pressure that you might put on your children as a result of that, even if you're not saying it. So I always think about that too. Look at that. Damn, I might need some bleach for that, right? That side piece. But that'll give some, that gives a story, some test, some little bit of testimony right there, that little side piece that's a little dingy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I said, you've been somewhere. You know what I'm saying? These ain't fresh. So you said the process of cleaning sneakers is therapeutic. Mm -hmm. When it comes to in my shoes, the focus is the cleaning of the sneaker. But as you clean sneakers, you start to tell stories. Mm -hmm. What's the story that you run in your head as you clean sneakers? Um, well, this little die came off already. <laughs> but um, um, I don't want to tell myself this story. Oh, I do got soul separation. <gasps> oh no! I didn't think I had any on these, but as you can see, these are '09s. How long have you had them for? I got them in '09. So what's that? Ooh, yeah, I just seen this. Mm. But that's okay, right? You gotta wear your sneakers. But I've been wearing these. But, yeah. Um. I don't like, I mean, it just depends on time of day, Juice, on what story I'm telling myself while I'm cleaning these. I'm just, if I'm cleaning them, I'm usually not running no stories through my head. I'm just in the moment cleaning the shoe mm -hmm. and just, you know, looking at the shoe, making sure it's clean and to my liking and just examining it and stuff like that. But as we examine, we see. We got some toe separation. <laughs> That's all right. Would you say there's very few moments we get to be present with the work that we do in the mental health space? Absolutely. Um, primarily because it's on to the next thing. You do one thing and then you gotta put out another fire. You um, achieve one goal and you gotta jump to the next thing. And so I think sometimes we don't sit enough with our, our actual selves to reflect on what we have accomplished because we always move into the next thing. And then that, I think, can lead to some burnout and compassion fatigue or kind of still looking at, am I, am I good enough to do this work? Or is anything going to ever change? Right? <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's something that probably pops up sometimes. You know. Man, these got a little flavor on, too, you can see. Mm. A little white scuffing on and need to get repainted. But you ever bowled in them? I have. Mm. Everybody looked at me crazy. But they basketball sneakers too. These are probably one of the most comfortable Jordans to play ball in, but mm -hmm. you know, but um Yeah man, these are um they got some they can tell a story, they got a little life to them. But they also probably one of my cleanest, oldest pair I got. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I gotta get that in the strings. 
in terms of everybody looking at me crazy, you recently wrote a book. Yes. Would you say things have changed for you or opened up a little bit more now that you finally put that work out there? Um, somewhat. But I think the thing about it, Juice, is that <laughs> the book, I don't promote the book enough. Mm-hmm. Um, I, it's always a kind of an added luxury when I talk about it. Um, and I need to do more about it. But it has helped folks. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, so it's just a, I think a, a perk and an added luxury on what I'm doing. Getting squared away. And it just goes along with all the work that I've been trying to do, which is, you know, help black men and their mental health, you know, give them an outlet, let mm-hmm. them know they're not alone. And let them know that folks, you know, brothers do be going through stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we be going through stuff. But, but yeah. So. Are you ever surprised when the work you put out there helps the people that you would hope that it could one day help? Sometimes. Yeah. But sometimes, man, you, you put, that book was very vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And so, um. To put it out there and then to see that actually somebody read it and really applied it to their life or related. We talked about relatability earlier. Yeah. When somebody related to it and they can push it, I said, man, that's crazy to me. But, it, you know, that's the intention, right? Mm-hmm. And so, um, but you'll get those stories back and people will say how they it helped them out or helped their son, brother, husband out or they related to this, they related to that. And... You feel good about it. You feel great about it. You feel like it did its intended purposes, and you move. You keep moving. Keep moving forward with it. Speaking of moving, you're a professor now. Yes, sir. Collegiate. Yeah. And you're dealing with a lot of age groups and personalities. Mm-hmm. What's one unexpected thing you've come to learn in this new career path that you're presently on? One new thing I come to learn from this new career path. Um, it's a good question. I think that um, you have to be prepared for what you said earlier, the the variability in learning perspectives, dynamics, situations, um, why they are there in that program, what they're looking to achieve, and um, you know, balancing that out between the student and the person. They'll put themselves into the student, but the person has to be um, poured into as well, and sometimes that gets lost, so you have to remind them of that. Um, and if you remind them of that, that helps with, you know, them trusting you on their collegiate journey. Because um, you're not just a student to them. You're, you're a student, academic student, but you also care about them as a person. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's one of the one things I've learned in that space is it goes beyond just them being a student. If you want them to succeed. And I see a lot of them see a lot of myself and a lot of my students so it kind of correlates to my path and journey we ain't got no soul separation on these that's good (laughs) just got these paint that's crazy look at the red paint coming off of that that's crazy these bleed bleach though these bleach bleach. are there any packs that would be good for replenishing these kind of sneakers these would be packs like cleaning packs I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't know. Cause I'm old, I'm old school with it. Mm-hmm. I just bought this stuff. I ain't had my, look, I had some stuff that um, <laughs> I bought from the middle of the mall at Baton Mills. When mm-hmm. Some homies in the middle of the mall 10, 12, 15 years ago, it was called Refresh or mm-hmm. Renew Cleaner, something like that. Mm-hmm. That was the best cleaner I ever had. And I can't find it. Mm-hmm. And them boys sold me on that thing. And I was like, man, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and buy it cause it's sports y'all. 
and some some black homies, and I can't find it, and I'm so mad. I'm so mad. That was the best cleaner ever, bro. That was the best cleaner ever. Now I know they got stuff out there that can help restore. I know mm-hmm. people that restore, you know, kicks and stuff like that. Yeah. I would just say take it to them, man, because you got folks that will actually restore, clean and stuff up, mm-hmm. repair the soles, things like that. You know, but if you want them back in proper, but I like I like my my little nicks and neck nicks on these joints. I feel like you're having a you don't want know what you have until it's gone moment looking for that product and it's no longer in the market. Uh, I knew what I had. <laughs> I just got lost in the jungle. You know what I'm I knew what I had, boy. Because I put it, I was like, this joint works amazing. Mm-hmm. It was similar to what we use in the day, man, but I felt like it was a lot more potent. This this joint is, is straight, but it don't, it's not clean. It clean, all right, but it, it was it was good. It was good. You only use a few drops. Mm hmm. And get them out the way. What is it like to be a therapist in your private life? Former therapist. Ooh, you got to expound on that. Yeah, last time we talked, I was in the the process. The folks don't know who you are. Oh, man. (laughs) We not giving names? I mean, if you don't want to. Yeah, no, that's remember. Your your face isn't on this. Oh, that's true. You don't need to. Yeah, no, it's faceless, man. That's true. Yeah, that's the magic of just telling the story. My name is Blank, 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 yep. Blank, Blank. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. From Blankety Blank. From Blankety Blank, Blank. blank, blank. Yep. Oh, that's that's fire. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's so fire. Oh, um, man. Now I was former therapist, and I stopped my private practice uh, to focus more on teaching mm-hmm. and um, providing clinical supervision to the new super um, supervision to uh, social workers who are looking to become licensed. Yep. Um, so that's been a fun journey. And I've just been increasing more of my public speaking, um, consulting work as well. So it's been taking up most of my time. I transitioned, man, because I just couldn't balance everything and all. Uh, I couldn't do, I couldn't teach, be a therapist, supervise, be a family man, be a husband to my wife, be a father to my two kids, a son, you know, friend. I couldn't do all of that. Church, you know, leader. I couldn't do all that at the same time. Yeah. And providing um, therapy, which was one of my, you know, I think I've really loved to do that work and working with black men and stuff like that in that space, it's, it's definitely taxing. Um, and so I needed a kind of a separate. Now, would I do it again? I don't know. We'll see where it leads us. But I do enjoy where I'm at now, too. So, I, you know, I got options. Mm-hmm. If I want to kind of dibble and dabble, you know, back and forth on that. Um, so, yeah, man, it's just been... That was a journey, though, because, again, once you become a therapist or become out there as a licensed professional, folks see you that way. And they, you know, talk to you that way. They interact with you that way. And that actually does not leave because <laughs> um, people still reach out to me today asking me for referrals, if I'm still seeing people in therapy, um, all that. So I don't think it ever leaves. But, again, I'm also... It's not a lot of black male therapists <laughs> to find. So you go to the folks or at least somebody that you think you know or aware of and ask them, you know. And it's a different beast. I think it's a different ball game. It's a little bit more front street putting yourself out there some little bit. Why do you have such a strong emphasis on men? It's a good question. Never thought about that. I don't know. I feel... I feel like nobody's talking about them. Nobody's really engaging with them. Or if they do, it's like really, very surface level. And um, it's scary. Because the, the suicide rate for black boys and men, and we've talked about this multiple times, yeah. has increased. Exponentially. Exponentially over the last 10 years. And nobody's like, okay, hey, well, yeah, this is happening, but nobody's really, like, panicking. And I'm like, y'all don't think it's a, a bigger, a major issue than what we're making it out to be? You know? And so I think that's why. And, and nobody was really... I've been doing this work with black men probably since 2018, 2019. Maybe 2017. But, um, you know, and it, nobody was talking about it. Nobody was having a conversation about it. It's business as usual. And then... uh. Outside of the mental aspect, there's the physical aspect. Brothers are dying earlier and earlier in life. 
physical health conditions, mental health conditions, you know, physical and medical conditions. And we got to get, you know, I, I, I'm a black man. I have black male friends, right? I'm raising a black boy. I want to make sure that, you know, we are healthy mentally, physically, and spiritually. Um, and so I think that's why I think I go so hard about it and talk about it so much and, and try to address the need because I don't feel like nobody's really paying attention to talking about it, you know? So it's always like, hey, we'll figure it out. Well, I don't want to figure it out. I need to process and get some tangible solutions. I uh, have a theory that I think the biggest problem is when it comes to mental health and the space for men, we keep using the word solution and not enough of us are thinking of, hey, what if there actually isn't a real solution for the problem that's happening with men in the mental health space and us not getting help Mm -hmm. or us getting help not being taken seriously. And the reason I say that is when you think of a solution, a solution usually means you have an idea of what the process is and that process works for about 80% of everybody who's involved. Mm -hmm. But as you and I know from doing the work in person and with people, you know, being the bleeding hearts that we are, there's a lot of people who don't make it. Yeah. Even if we are helping them, even if we give them the right resources, are or there are people who prefer who they were before the help and they go back to that. Yeah. <clears throat> but why do you think that we can't provide solutions? Because we can get into a bigger conversation about racism, mm-hmm. you know, patriarchy and white supremacy. We can get into a lot of that conversation. Yeah. Um, and that, that conversation usually plays onto one thing that you and I are aware of is are men actually taking mental health seriously? So for I folks would, like you and I... I would say our systems uh uh-huh. taking mental health seriously. Th- we could get to that, but whether the system is taking something seriously or not, you and your community are the people that make demands of the system. Does that make sense? It, so you know I'm big on I don't want to put too much of an emphasis of the victim shouldn't have to carry the burden. Right. But there are certain moments that you are not the victim or you haven't yet become the problem for yourself. And there are things that you have to stand for before you know you need them. Like, for example, we know that we need dental care. (laughs) You can't negotiate that. You feel what I'm saying? You know that at a certain age, you have to get a prostate exam because there's so many of us that are catching cancer that are just unaware of it. Well, I'll stop you right there. That's assumed yeah. because there's a lot of folks who, who don't have solid dental care. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of folks who don't check their prostates mm-hmm. um, and they have they don't even don't have insurance or they they do have good insurance and they don't do that. And they it's either because we don't see ourselves in the medical space we've mm-hmm. been harmed in the medical space we've been wrong in the medical space mm-hmm. I'm all for accountability and taking action to you know use those resources to do what we gotta do mm-hmm. but we also still have to take into a big percentage of the system yeah of its harm that has been done to us and how it's, it's treatment of black men in those spaces and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what has been normalized you know as a result of that yeah you know what I'm saying so it's it's twofold of course, but, but it's hard for me to place blame singly on the ones who've been oppressed and oh, victimized. No, no, I would never place blame on them slowly. That's yeah, that's yeah, yeah. that's wild. I wouldn't do that. What I would say is, whether you acknowledge it as there is a problem in the men community, especially the black men community when it comes to mental health or not, yeah, it still does start with the, are we actually entertaining the conversation? And in our awareness of rejecting these facts, is that what is leading us to not at least seeking help or looking for other variations of what help is? Because our platform started because we don't see enough of what we need. Yeah. That's usually what everything we do across the board starts with. So 
we'll come across other people's pages and we'll realize, ah, damn, we don't have that. I'm glad someone did yeah, that. And then yeah. we start to build up and then we're like, oh, let's meet with these brothers or, hey, have you talked to so-and-so or, hey, who knows this person? I think a good example of that would be Aaron in New York. Yeah. And right. the work that he does. Shout you feel what Aaron. I'm saying? Yeah. When you and I first started our work, you started your work way before I started my work. He was one of the people you said, hey, reach out to him. Pick his brain for a little bit. You know, this is the work that he's doing. This may be someone that you're interested in working with in the future or in the present. Yeah. And instead of him and I doing work, I reached out and we just had simple conversation. Yeah. Check in. And he wasn't my cup of tea for the work that I was doing, but he was my cup of tea for someone that I did need in my private life to just have general conversations with. And even at my big old age now, I don't forget the time that he's made for me in the past. Yeah. Which is, it's very easy as we fight this fight and we do the work that we forget the people who we've built relationships with that really were our foundations to go out there confidently and do something. Exactly. No, I agree. I agree. I mean, I think that it's, it's, we can, I, here's the thing. Mm-hmm. I believe men will go get help or at least have a conversation if the setting is right mm-hmm. and there is enough influence to do so. Yeah. I've seen it happen yeah. um, in these different spaces I've been occupying, um, whether that's the barbershop, mm-hmm. whether that's individual and in the, in the actual you know therapeutic environment, working with clients, yeah. whether that's on an academic setting. Um, I think the problem is is there space for black men to be vulnerable mm-hmm. or to express, I am fearful or scared, scared of going to the doctor due mm-hmm. to this, that, and the third. I don't think this is a big issue. This is why, without judgment. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Even space for recreating what does calling your fellow man look like. Exactly. Yeah. And so and testing that out. And so, and I think too, also, it's just like, we we've gotten to the point where we don't give people like some chances to really get through that stuff. Yeah. And it's like, oh, well, you don't, you didn't say this, or you didn't do this, and it's that one time only, mm-hmm. and then it's like you write them off. Yeah. And for men, if you if you do if you really do work with men, you know, mm-hmm. it is not it's one time <laughs> only. It ain't gonna work out. You about to spin that block a couple. You, of you times. gonna have to spin that block a couple times to get yeah. it, to make it get right or put it package it a different way. Yeah. And so. I, all the work that I've been doing since we last talked, I mean, mm-hmm. I've been doing it in different spaces, and it's just like... We last talked about a year ago, exactly a year ago from this month. It was? It was, yeah, it was, it was close to a year ago from this month, this yeah. month and date. So, yeah, so since then, man, we've just been in different spaces, right? And, mm-hmm. and the need for that vulnerability in that space for brothers to really heal. And that's just start also, I think, as far as grade school with black boys. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So we can be developed versus where we just wait until adulthood to address these things. Mm-hmm. Yes, there's toxic masculinity that we need to work through. Absolutely. Yeah. There's patriarchy and things that we benefit from. Absolutely working through that. But again, if there's not enough created curated spaces for men to do that in these different settings, mm-hmm. right? Then it's going to be hard to change the title. This is a perfect example of what that looks like. Right, exactly. Like, uh, one of my folks hit me up and they were like, hey, man, so are you going to do an event where you and a room full of men sit down and you clean shoes together and you have a whole conversation? Mm, see? And I was like, that should be something that I put together for the summertime. Yeah. And I think the hardest part, honestly, is going to be hiring the right staff to record that. Mm-hmm. And how do you set the room up where no man's face is shown and we're just having general conversation and the audio's picked up well? And do we really have an opportunity to tell our stories in those spaces? So that's what the next iteration of this looks like. That'd be cool. So right now, this is just a concept until I make it bigger and I make it larger. And then we figure out, okay, what's the purpose of where the in my shoes concept is supposed to lead for the man or the woman who comes on to the shows that we do he's gonna need more mics bro I, yeah yeah no yeah more mics, no yeah mics. you know i know about that audio side man yeah. it, it irks me when i yeah. think about i think i have these these grand ideas that aren't that grand with the right people you well, know what i'm saying i mean grand but not you know it's still it's something not that's impossible. not possible it's not impossible yeah and i think that too you know, making sure that um, 
sneakers do bring folks to bring guys together to have conversations like this just how we went into talking about sneakers to mm-hmm. you know the mental health space and what's going on it can be easily curated in that, that aspect yeah and it's something that's something i've been doing too i've been having barbershop talks down my way going to the barbershop having conversations and just open dialogue mm-hmm. and just you know really discussing what's happening with with each other um and, and and i don't move in that space as a therapist i move in that space as a man with yeah. them yeah and so and then that leads to open other dialogue and having that conversation but that's something that i'm seeing more it's not my original concept but i'm mm-hmm. seeing more happening like let's go meet the brothers where they at yeah yeah a lot and, of people are afraid to do that it's yeah. like you shouldn't be you shouldn't be if you if you ask them if you want better for someone that means at a certain point you're going to have to stand in the same soil as them. Yeah, and that's what I tell when I do speaking engagements around mm-hmm. engaging black men in these spaces. Yeah, if you're scared to go to communities or go meet them where they're at, mm-hmm. then that's part of the problem. Yeah, that's part of your bias too. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So, um, and that's something that needs to be addressed when we start talking about the systems. You know, mm-hmm. it can't. I, here's the thing. It can be on us to, to provide these spaces and do the work that we need to do. Mm-hmm. But it ain't just us. It's not. It ain't just us. It's not. It ain't just us. We're not the majority. We're not. So, you know, somebody else got to step up too. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? To do that work as well. And that's what I also, you know, get into my social work bag around bias and, you know, racism and things like that, white privilege, all that. You got to... You got to step up and do the work to make it feel comfortable. You know, I had a man moment yesterday. <laughs> a man moment. Yeah, nah, me and my girl, we were, uh, we had a disagreement about something that we spoke about. And I thought we were cool. I thought everything was fine. I woke up, had a phone call, a 15 minute phone call. Now, when I wake up, I'm not, I'm not the best wake up person. I have like a 45 minute dial up. <laughs> <laughs> before I'm in it. Like, I just know, yo, 45 minutes. And I could make an exception for someone who, if I say I got to call you at that time, even if I wake up one minute before, I got you. Yeah. I got like a 45 second window, but I got you. And she approached me about the problem with something that I said to her, like immediately after the phone call was done. Mm-hmm. And what was ironic was I completely disagree with everything that she said and I let it be known I said look fam what you're upset with me about was not what I said and how I meant for it to come out or be taken but if you took it that way yes I apologize but like that's not my responsibility especially if this is what you're talking to me and I just woke up yeah right (laughs) and I didn't word the I just woke up part but I could feel myself getting upset, right? Mm-hmm. And when she skedaddled and left out, I was I was pissed for about two hours. It had two hours of woo and working through it. But then, you know, I did something that old me wouldn't have done. And I really thought about it. And I was like, well, well, was she wrong, though? Yeah. Like, in the thing that I was being called out on and what I said and how it was taken, was this person wrong in the conversation? And I was like, no, nah. I was like, I could see how the person would take it that way, even if it wasn't meant that way. And even that if that wasn't my intention. Right. And I cleared it up later in a follow up conversation. But I also let it be known. You know, what you said wasn't wrong. But the timing of when you did it was, I think, what took me over the edge, because, like, usually I'm good for a hey, man, you know, you're Gucci is fine or, oh, you have a valid point. I'm great for a mature conversation. But I let it be known quite often. I'm actually not a mature person. I'm very childish. <laughs> what, what people see as maturity or he does a great job, that is me working on it. Working like on in it. the present. That I'm presently working on it. Yeah. So the maturity that comes back around the block a couple hours later isn't maturity because I'm adult. It's maturity because... And I explained this to her later because she was like, you know, well, what would be an appropriate time? I said, you know, probably an hour after I wake up or something like that. But I, but I also explained, she was like, well, you know, you get defensive in your language when you feel slighted or you feel someone comes at you wrong. Yeah. 
And I explained to her, I was like, you know, that is true and that's who I am. But I was like, you know, the old version of me just used to shut down and there was no conversation. Right. So what you have right now is the upgraded version, unfortunately. And the upgraded version may not be the best version you want when things happen, but it's way better than who I was before you got me. Yeah. <laughs> you feel me? Like yeah. you, you can have a car for 15 years and year 19, all of a sudden it's doing this thing. That you didn't see coming, but I was like, no, nah, actually, that thing was there all the time. That's the upgraded version after you've had enough oil changes, and this is what it's become. But see, I think that's that's good insight, introspection into who mm-hmm. you are as a person, where you've grown, but then also taking inventory of your understanding of yourself in the morning mm-hmm. and, and how that relates. Yeah. I tell a lot of guys, you know, because a lot of guys talk about, like, okay, well, my wife nagging, my spouse nagging, she complaining about stuff, how I talk to her, and it's not that big a deal for me, or I was doing this and I was doing that, and she didn't see that, and she didn't see that. I said, well, did you communicate that to her? Yeah. Because it's your job to communicate to that to that person that you need time to process, mm-hmm. or let me get back to you. It's not the other person's job to just assume. Yeah. Right? You got to speak it up. You got to establish those norms. And then hopefully over time it becomes standard practice, right? Mm-hmm. And then also looking at the fact that you know you apologize if you know that wasn't your intention, but it came off that way. Yeah. So let me soften my tone, or let me shape my 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 viewpoint on it, or how I say it, but also be mindful too. Asking me maybe in depth questions at this time in the morning mm-hmm. is not going to be my best response. It's probably going to be a little bit more tone deaf or rigid. just rigid yeah, you know real rigid and it's not speaking to you mm-hmm. specifically yeah it's just a setting in the time of the morning as it is mm-hmm. and that's good I, my, my i always talk about a communication comprehension expectation yeah you know what i'm saying yeah and it and, and then one of the things i talk about with guys and even in these different spaces when we say oh well, black man you need to go to therapy or you need to go talk to somebody you need to or you don't communicate you don't express yourself mm-hmm. right you don't tell me what's going on are do we assume that that black man has the language mm-hmm. and capacity to express what he might be really feeling mm-hmm. and if he's he doesn't then are we giving space and grace for that all right you gotta break down language and you gotta break down capacity and how these two things work together Lang- break down language mm-hmm Language, well, it depends on the setting, right? What is your language and the words that you're using to yep. communicate how you feel in that moment, right? So it doesn't just mean a big vocabulary. Sometimes no. it means the right vocabulary. No. So, for example, if I come here and I say, Juice, I'm tired. Mm-hmm. I'm tired. That can mean seven things. Yeah, but if I, if, I, if I say explicitly to you, I'm just tired. Okay, Trey, where are you tired from? I'm tired from, you know, going to work today. Mm-hmm. That explicitly says what I'm doing. Yeah. Versus, are you good, Trey? Mm-hmm. No, nah, I'm not good. Yeah, that can mean a thousand different things, right? So, we start talking about the emotional vocabulary and language. You're also talking about expanding the actual language and feelings beyond just happy, sad. Oh, you good? I'm good. I'm straight. You straight? Beyond that, no, let's put an emotion or a feeling to that, mm-hmm. right? And then allowing that to be the, the the I would say the foundation of how we feel in that moment, so people know, mm-hmm. right? But to think that all black men have that capacity or that vocabulary mm-hmm. and language is, is not fair because we don't. We wasn't taught that as yep. men, right? And we're still learning that. I have, I've had clients or I've had past guys, older adults, that still are trying to learn that, mm-hmm. right? And then... Still struggling. Still struggling with that, yeah. right? Um, but then we go into the capacity piece. The capacity looks at... I, 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 I do the example like this. You got your battery camera. Mm-hmm. Or storage on the camera, mm-hmm. right? You got 256 gigabytes. Yep. Right? If you push that thing up to 210, mm-hmm. it's going to move a little slow. Yep. To upload. Yep. The load. Right? A little bit too much load. It's too much yep. load. It yep. does not have enough capacity to handle the yep. storage mm-hmm. and what you're trying to upload yep. or download. And it's the foundation of the camera really built for that. Exactly. Yeah. Right? So you have to bring that capacity down mm-hmm. and clear that. And so that's taking inventory of. Okay, what's my capacity threshold or what am I able to handle right now in this moment? Yeah. And then can I communicate that so that my spouse, my friend, my loved ones, my friends, my brothers, they can understand where I'm at mm-hmm. and help assist. Yeah. But Juice, that is 
that does not happen overnight. Ah, uh, nah, years, 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 literally, and especially if you have some trauma a decade. or yeah. negative experiences around that conversation, relationships, whatever. Mm-hmm. It is going to take years. Yeah. And so I need people to understand, especially with brothers, these things. People want. To, I want them to get help. I want them to get treatment. I got. I, you know, if people come up and ask me like, that guy has to be ready to change. Mm-hmm. But also, you're going to have to give some patience with him to work through all of these different things Mm -hmm. because how we interact with the world yeah is different than everybody else yeah you know what i'm saying so same thing for black women same thing for black people in general Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying all of that it's just we got to give space for that yeah and i think that we're impatient of course with with, with our men for that yeah you know i'm saying impatient with our boys as well with that Mm -hmm. so it reflects on us. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I think a uh, best example of our impatience is when your dad is asking you to grab a tool from the tool bag and he's like, yeah, man, you know, it's the, it's the one that's second from the left. Right. And it's like, as a kid, you go into the tool bag and you're like, fam, these all look the same. And we say it's second from the left. What left am I starting from? Am I starting from the tip of the bag that's closest to us? Am I starting from the end of the bag that's closest to the bathroom? Are we going from right to left in terms of like the bag being open Mm -hmm. and you being the person who messes with your tools, you put your tools in as the father a certain way, but your son, your son still doesn't realize how you order your tools. He's never studied your craft. He doesn't know your habit. He doesn't know your placement. He doesn't know that you may think something that's second to the right is actually from the bottom up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, (laughs) Not the top down. And, and, and yeah. you, you got to communicate that, and then you can, pops get mad. Well, you know what I'm talking about? No, no, I don't. I don't. That's why we're having the conversation. But again, that yeah. goes back to, I, I need to communicate that, mm-hmm. right, and, and express that what that looks like. Yeah. Develop the habit. Develop the pattern. Mm-hmm. So now I know when pops said go get the tool from the, in the back second from the left, mm-hmm. he usually lays the tools out this way. Yeah. Pops, you mean the ratchet over here or mm-hmm. the, the, the the screwdriver over here, the Phillips head over here? Yeah. Yes, that one. Or no, not that one. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I got you. But that's very intentional. Yeah. And goes and, back to our conversation. Most people don't have those intentions when they start something. Or express something. Yeah. Right? And per- this this actually goes back to when someone says, Hey, I need you to help me out. What does that help look like? Like yes. when someone says, I need to help you, they would like for you to help them out. Do you know the amount of time, weight, and distribution it's going to take to actually fulfill the needs of whatever help is for them? And are you really going to be able to have that conversation? What does that specific help look like? Yeah. And the intention behind it. Like you said, we talked about earlier, mm-hmm. right? You know what I'm saying? If I need, hey, I need some help. What type of help would you like, right? Or I need help changing my tire. I need help working on this car. That's all I need you for is like an hour or two. Mm-hmm. But if somebody is in emotional stress, yeah, where they're just dealing with emotions and behaviors and mental health challenges throughout that time, it may be hard to communicate that, mm-hmm. right? If somebody's hyper vigilant, meaning that they're like always on edge, they're watching where they're going, looking to see if some harm is going to be done to them, mm-hmm. they might not be able to express that. Yeah. And it's hard to communicate what type of help I need when I'm already in a heightened state. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so being at a, I would say, present state, kind of referring back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, that's where working to be present in these different settings and different spaces in your life is helpful to be able to communicate, to be able to express yourself, but also to be able to know what's going on with yourself. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that takes time. A lot of time. It took me a lot of time to even get to this point to even communicate that to you yeah. in that way in such of a clear manner. Mm-hmm. You feel what I'm saying? And that's because we were both looking forward to this conversation. Yeah. But yeah. I couldn't have that conversation with you probably 10 years ago. No. Nah. No. You know what no. I'm saying? No. No. I would have been out of my depth. Yeah. So I would, yeah. At, a point, at a certain point, I would probably be like, what the hell are we even talking about at this point? You right. know, eggs is eggs. And it's like, nah, do you like them sunny side up? Do you like them scrambled? What was do you that like matter? it fried that? hard? Yeah, what does that matter? Do you matter? like it seasoned? Do you like it with just black pepper? You, do you like it with McCormick's? You know right. what they coming out with? So well, you like pepper jack cheese on it. Yeah. <laughs> huh? Good reference, good reference, good pepper reference. Pepper jack cheese on that thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. So that's, it's, it's very, we got to take time, man. Mm-hmm. And that's where the kind of referring back, man. What does time mean? Time means everything. Yeah. Time means everything. Um, True. And you know, you know what's funny though about that conversation? Even even when I was explaining to her 
that she was right and here's where I was wrong, I could still feel myself getting pissed in that moment of understanding ah, the night later, the same day in the night that she was right. But like that has nothing to do with her. Now that's an internally me thing. That's a me thing. That's a uh, and and I explained to her I was like you know there's a part of me that's afraid to be my parents because I've seen how they've dipped, dodged, and in some cases been a tyrant about certain things that it wasn't necessary. So I was like you know there's there's the seventy percent that's you, and then there's that thirty percent of them that's just instilled in you that you don't get to negotiate. Yeah. And I was like you know I think the story of a lot of things that I do is how do I figure out how to hold those parts back or understand that there's no value in using those tools I've been given and how I was raised. Depends on if if it's, I mean, we we all get foundational stuff from our parents that we have to either use or work with or work through. Use or lose. Use or lose. Um, But it's foundational. Yeah. And and when I find those moments where I'm getting irritated or upset about something, mm-hmm. primarily if it's something that I wasn't tripping about earlier, yeah. Then I look at myself inwardly and say, "What is going on with you today? Yeah. Are you stressed out? Have you been doing too much? Did you get things done that you needed to get done? Mm-hmm. Are you um, rushed?" Mm-hmm. So when I'm rushed. I've noticed when I'm rushed or if I have something I want to get done knocked out and I don't get it done, that irritates me. But what happens is then other things get more heightened and irritable. Starts rolling Start into rolling. everything else, little snowball effect. And so I'll, I may be snappy or I might be mm-hmm. a little bit less empathetic, right? Yeah. I'll catch myself or my wife will tell me, like, hey, you're bugging. <laughs> you tripping, but, yeah. but um, And I'll catch myself and I'll ask myself, yo, what's going on? What's happening? And I'll see, and I'll say, like, okay, I need to slow down, or I didn't get this done. Yeah. Or I'm being rushed. So now, and, and, and one of those things is that I used to deal with that a lot in my, you know, my 20s and, you know, teenage years about just rushing to mm-hmm. do stuff and getting things done. But it's like taking more of a pace to that so it doesn't, um, it doesn't allow for me to um, be overly irritable. Yeah. Because then a lot of times people don't understand, too, how much, you know, a lot of the way we respond to stuff is due to stuff that we're dealing with internally. That's the cost of doing business. Yeah. And it's really, and we're not addressing it. Yeah. So then old people catch the, 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 flames, the strays, you know, the strays of it. And it's like, that's not fair to them. You, you let them shoot at you like that? Yeah. That's not fair to them, bro. <laughs> you know, they gonna shoot at you. What? Where they, what yeah. are they messing me for? Like, I ain't in you know what I'm saying? But mm-hmm. that's what it is. And so I take inventory now. It sounds like you did the same thing. No, I had to. I you had know? to. I've, uh, uh, Contrary to belief, I love burning bridges. <laughs> no, I do, man. Oh, man. I, 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 I hate, like, growing up, I had a fear of fire. But, like, let me tell you something. The folks who have a fear of fire are usually the first ones that are using it in all the wrong extreme ways in their fear of the object. Do you feel like burning bridges is something that you've learned, or is it a protective factor, defense mechanism? Uh, Burning bridges, for me, feel, you know how people say something feels lethargic? Yeah, that's how burning bridges feel for me. So I usually avoid that feeling because, like, you you don't want to chase lethargic. You don't you don't want to chase that sensation every time. Like mm-hmm. when you have it, it's a blessing when you have it. But you do need to know the limit of like, hey man, are we are we chasing the sensation compared to actually realizing what's happening in that moment because we're chasing that feeling. Mm-hmm. So I'm very much like, hey man, you might be going too far. <laughs> so when you say chasing that feeling mm-hmm. or the other what was the other thing you said mm, chasing that feeling or sensation when you say chasing that feeling mm-hmm. of a, being lethargic what does that mean though when, when, you burn, when you burn a bridge there's a certain freedom and I no longer have to be responsible for whatever that relationship was or what it meant to me mm-hmm. um, I usually think about I have, uh, whether something bad happens to me or not from the relationship, it was a blessing when I got it. Mm -hmm. And it's a blessing when it's finally gone. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what the blessing was while you were there? Mm -hmm. So with that kind of view, 
there's something dangerous in that thinking because most people are like, oh, no, that's super positive. That means that everything is great. But that also means that sometimes when you get things, you're already looking forward to it being over before you get a chance to really like embrace what it actually is and what it may have done to you as a person, because each one of your relationships does change a little bit of who you are as you grow. Okay. You get what I'm saying? It's like the same, like, let's say you have a, a, a Chevy, let's say Chevy Malibu, right? Mm-hmm. And you start mixing in a couple of Toyota parts, you start mixing in a couple of uh, Ultima parts, and then the car still works. But when the mechanic, who's a newer mechanic that goes into your car and sees what's going on, he's like, I have no idea how this car is still running, but it performs well. But I have no idea how these parts are running because these parts belong to two other cars, but we can't take it out anymore because the heat and the fusion from the engine has fused everything together. So we got to just make it work with how it is. And sometimes you do have to diagnose what have those parts done to you that you've incorporated into the thing. And are you going to be able to live without those parts after? But why will you use other parts in that? Because that's that's what it means when you grow with people. You get what I'm saying? Like when I was a when I was a kid, my mom was really big on like, hey, man, you know, there's certain people you shouldn't hang out with because they're going to be a bad influence on you. And it's like, you know, saying that to your kids is, quote unquote, the right decision. But you don't actually know their friends. You just assume who their friends have been that they're with are bad. Mm -hmm. So a lot of friends I've had have actually been good friends to me that my mom thought were bad friends. But you also have to let your kid make the decision of what does good or bad look like for them because you're not going to be able to help them make all the decisions in life. Just give them recognition. See, I think... So I think a little opposite of that. Mm-hmm. I think that, first of all, we're not putting no type of Toyota parts in the Chevy Malibu. That was just crazy. Wow, that came with that. Now, I, was like, yeah. why yeah, I know, that? I know. You was like, "Yo, why, why would, would you, you do, that? do that? Why would you do that? No, yeah, never. Well, well, you're saying never, but my guy who I actually interviewed before you, his dad used to change out full engines from one truck into another truck. Yeah, I mean you swap. I mean you can you can you can make. All right, okay. okay. I see what you're doing. I see what you're doing. I see what you're doing. So all right, uh huh. In theory, I got a BMW, right? Mm-hmm. I could put a Chevy LS1 engine mm-hmm. into my BMW truck or car. Eight cylinder, right? Eight cylinder, mm-hmm. full bred American muscle. Yeah. You know, into that. Mm-hmm. Folks do that. Yeah. Right and. Make crazy power. It's yeah. just it's kind of look cool. Maybe even mix some beer to get the battery to work again. Yeah, you know, backwood stuff. Thing. It makes yeah. it works, right? But then you got purists that would say, mm-hmm. "Why would you do that? Yeah, why would you put American muscle into German-made engineering? Mm-hmm. It's already good by itself. They make VH da 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 da." Yeah. But here's the thing: in relationships, right? I think you're absolutely correct. Mm-hmm. We will grow, develop, and we will use some parts of ourselves. You fold it into yourself as you go. Yeah, you mold yourself. But I think that if we lose ourselves Mm -hmm. in that respective spaces with those relationships, Mm -hmm. that could be a potential problem. Well, that's why you're supposed to know the core of who you are. But we don't if we're growing Mm -hmm. because we're still growing. Mm -hmm. So so that takes time to learn fully who you are, right? So if I'm doing right now, if I'm making friendships right now, I got my core guys, like mm-hmm. you, fuck other folks, like you know. So it's not. It's gonna be hard to kind of recreate 10, 15 years of relationships mm-hmm. that I got now. Not saying I won't meet people along the way professionally that I might end up with some of those friends, but for me, I can't allow you to also change who I am, mm-hmm. right, and still operate who I am as a person. Yeah. Right now, there are positive qualities, things you might influence or. You know, I would say motivate me to do and things like that. I might, you know, we might share lingo. We might be more inclined to get into something else of interest or, you know, see things from a different perspective from you. Mm -hmm. But at my core, I still should be me. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I think in your situation, when as far as like lethargic in that sense, I don't know if I would categorize it as lethargic. Mm -hmm. I would categorize it as just, you know, saying being self-aware and it's nothing wrong being self-aware. How do you define lethargic? I'm thinking lethargic as lazy Mm -hmm. or just it's not it's just slowly moving it's not doing anything Mm -hmm. that's how I define it how you define it I usually think of lethargic as and I guess 
our definitions are similar to each other, but the process is different. Yoga to me is lethargic. It's a slow moving concept. You're stretching things out. You're breaking it down as you go and you're feeling through things to the most extreme. Mm. For me, that's how yoga has been for me. So when I think of a lethargic process, when I'm in the middle of something being lethargic, I'm not thinking it's lethargic. But when I look back at it, I realize, oh, for me, that was a lethargic process. I would have never categorize yoga as lethargic. See, that's the difference. Communication yeah, 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 but that's, 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 that's why I was like, you know well, how do you define it? it? Yeah. Because people define things differently, uh-huh. right? And I think we need to under, be open to that mm-hmm. um, more. Because I've never would have... I never would define yoga as lethargic. Mm-hmm. I would define yoga as intentional. Yeah. Right? Because you're... Pro- even to get into those poses, to your deep breathing, things mm-hmm. like that, that's all intentionality and mindful. Mm-hmm. You know but what I'm saying? after you're done, you feel super relaxed you super and you yeah. let something go and you have the release of. Yeah. But I would never categorize it as lethargic because mm-hmm. to me, lethargic, I would say, to me, is more, I would say, in the, the negative space. Okay. So well, what would an example of that be? Because like with yoga, once I said yoga, you thought of the process of yoga, you could see it. You've probably done yes. a couple of yoga classes. So you could see where the experience of that would be. So for you... What would be a physical example of what lethargic would look and feel like? A physical example would be somebody that's like very slow moving, mm-hmm. not moving fast at all or at their actual regular pace. But as you said, that's the negative space. Yeah, that's, that's the what thought I would process thought. of it. Yeah, yeah, I've never looked I at it. I feel like we're having like a glass half full, glass half empty yeah, no, moment. No, I, that's how I want it. Look, I came up here with this soul intention. I was thinking about it last time you hit me. Yeah. I said, look. Well, I'm not going to let Juice get away with the day. <laughs> this time. These loaded questions and these, 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 these deep, insightful moments. We will unpack. But what's funny, unpack. Is, what's funny is I haven't actually asked anything deep. Mm-hmm. I think I haven't asked anything deep today. One could surmise that if they listen to that, that mm-hmm. it's super loaded and deep. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, Because I find myself when I'm talking with you, I'm having to travel with you to go through it. Yeah. And process it and hear it versus just straight. Mm-hmm. So that's why I ask those follow up questions around it and then yeah. make you define it what it is. Yeah. And that way it can clarify it. And then we come to two different, you know, understandings mm-hmm. of what those, that word means. And for me, for me, the though, that's exciting because I get to see how you think of things or how you have had to view things. And I think someone's view is usually defined by what they've gone through. True. You feel what I'm saying? So, like, I look forward to and accept hardship, even though I don't get excited for it. I always find ways to create excitement around the hardships. Expound upon that. Um, NFL tryouts. You, well, most people who think of doing pro tryouts for sports, and what's funny is it's funny how much I use sports of examples for things, but sports to me really do relate to a lot of things. Yes. Absolutely. Like, what does teamwork look like for you? Teamwork? Collaborative effort. What do you expect of people around you, and what do you expect of yourself? So most people would usually be like, I expect to be a winner. Ah, you've gone too far. There's a process to To being a winner. There's a process to winning do you win as an individual do you win as a team and what does that look like or do you get bothered by folks who don't pick up the slack but before you get to being bothered by folks who don't pick up the slack why is there internally in your head an acceptance of slack happening because you're already a team so you guys are supposed to have your own amount of weight Mm -hmm. so why are you expecting parts of the team to not work correctly for there to be slack that exists if you have the right players and the right components and the right folks to get it done. And most of the time I'm in a team or most of the time I've been in sports, I don't think I've ever been surrounded by the right folks, but I think we've also always done a great job of figuring out, I will, if this is what I have, not just how do I maximize that, but how do I intensify whatever results we're going to get and how do I enjoy it? I would say... How do I maximize everybody's strengths? Because everybody's going to always have a weakness. But not everybody wants to be maximized. I don't believe that. In that setting or a team setting? I've seen it. I've seen it. In a team setting? Not just in a team setting. Team doesn't just happen when you sign up for sports and you guys start playing together. Sometimes team 
as an adult, teams is who do you see at the gym and who's going hard versus who's not there to go hard and would just like to keep at their own pace. Uh, roll it back, though. Roll it back because uh-huh. if we – so it, it depends on the, con, it, the, spectrum, <laughs> the concept of the team. It yeah. is team-oriented versus individual-oriented. So individual <clears throat> motivation does – can be you know i mm-hmm. think yes you i can relate and agree to that but yeah. if we're part of this collaborative effort as a team mm-hmm. then we are should be able to say okay well we all have strengths and weaknesses mm-hmm. how do i maximize right even if you don't want to that's where the greatest champions comes in they maximize those strengths of folks around them in their team game mm-hmm. right and you have to want that mindset. And if you don't have that mindset to be maximized, you're not going to be able to be part of that team. If we're talking specifically about championship winners and yeah. great, successful team players. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's set. Now, if we're talking about some other stuff, you're absolutely correct. Some folks don't want to be maximized. Somebody don't, some folks don't want to be pushed. Mm-hmm. Some folks don't want to exceed. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I don't got a lot of those folks around me, though. You can do me a favor, put the sneaker here. It's, I'm focused on everything oh, yeah, on the sneaker. Yeah, yeah. The sneaker does the talking. So, like, wherever oh, the yeah, sneaker I'll... goes, I, I just keep moving the camera there. I'm yeah. like, oh, okay, the sneaker's there. That's it's where the camera goes. You so, good, you're good. So, yeah, I think, so that's the, that's another thing. So, it depends on context and situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're talking about relationships. That's different. Yeah. And talking about career and, you know, stuff in, in the, the nine to five set, that's different. Mm-hmm. So I think it's context matters in that situation. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So um, I've, I've spoken to a couple of folks that do like a lot of IT work, like the circles that I get into when it comes to like F5 load balancers and that stuff, other stuff like that. I'm sorry. I just, I just tech the convo. I shouldn't do that to you because you don't know what F5 load balancer is. So you, you Gucci. No, I'm a social worker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but... I say that to say um, we were talking to him because we were looking at a job together and he already works for the company. And I was like, you know, there's not enough focus on the team. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, you know, a lot of companies are having meetings, meetings, meetings because they don't want to make mistakes. But a lot of a lot of people don't want to admit this, but running a business means you're supposed to make mistakes. If you're afraid of all the mistakes happening every single five minutes, your team isn't going to learn if there's this overwhelming fear of making a mistake instead of making a mistake and how do you learn from the mistake to not make it again exactly if there's always a fear on dropping the ball or always a fear on oh if we get this wrong the client's not going to want to work with us your client will well depending depending on who you are or the sphere of money your client will be more appreciative of how you clean up a problem than someone who always has a fear of the problem that's never happened as long as they've done work with people. Mm-hmm. But I mean, then there's people who, professionally speaking, they develop so well into their craft that that fear comes from all the mistakes that they've made over the length of their career. Yeah. But then it's like, I, do you understand why this person is the way that they say that they are? Is it just about the delivery in itself and you keep the focus on the product? So when it comes to teamwork and when it comes to life in general and the way that I view things and why I approach everything from such a fear of tr- sphere of tryouts to now, I understand that whatever you think your journey is, in the beginning of the race, you're only able to see 7% of what the actual journey is going to be for you. And do you know how to make whatever you come into or the lens that keeps changing around you do you know how to make that exciting and meet that excitement where it is to get the best results for yourself that's why people should play sports <laughs> um, no, it brought up a conversation <laughs> thought I had before you said all that I forgot mm-hmm. it but I was, no no doing... no you good I just I was like nah I gotta bring that back around because I was like I was like damn we just had two combos there <laughs> I know how to put a bow on it. For I'm coming you. back. I'll come back. Come yeah, back. No, I, come I know back. how to put a bow on it. For um, you. Yeah. I, I want I want people to understand, and I want guys to definitely guys to understand, because I'm gonna probably do some more stuff with fatherhood and mm-hmm. understanding that some of the stuff. I think we have a, like a, this this infatuation with trying to know everything about the world, <laughs> and then also everything about ourselves. Yeah. We're supposed to go through life and experience life Mm -hmm. and learn, right? Yeah. And then that's where we will learn and grow. 
Yeah. And, and we have to be able to take life's lessons and understand and grow from that, right? And then, you know, deal with it in the moment and then learn from it and process it. It's some things, 35 now, right? Some things that I'm really getting an understanding of why it happened the way it happened, mm-hmm. why I behaved the way I behaved, why I said what I said, maybe in my 20s, maybe in my teenage years. I just understood it in my 30s, right? I just understood the value of this in my, you know, in the, my 20s, then my 30s. I'm pretty sure when I get to my 40s and 50s, there are some stuff that's happened now or will happen that I'll be like, all right, you know what? That's why that's happening or this is why I moved this way before it. But again, going back to our earlier conversations, mm-hmm. you have to have the, it takes time to learn that. Yeah. We are not supposed to know everything at a certain age yeah. and at a certain time frame. There are life experiences that happen for a reason to teach us what we need to know. And it, sometimes it might not make sense for several years, mm-hmm. right? But when it does, that's when it's the time. Yeah. Patience, right? Just don't have enough patience to let things develop and play out, right? Just like a play, right? You're playing football, mm-hmm. and that running back hit the hole. If he don't let that thing, the blockers do what they need to do, and he hit the hole too quick, mm-hmm. he's going to lose yards. Yeah. But let the play develop, let it play out, mm-hmm. hit the hole when you need to, yeah. five, ten-yard game. You feel what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And sports can get equated to life so easily. It says a game of runs and mm-hmm. basketball. We've seen it. Even though Dallas lost and Boston won. Shout out to Boston. But, wow, damn. That was, I didn't see you throwing that in there today. But, yep. but so, even with that, Dallas was playing Minnesota. And they would always say, best backcourt in the game right now, Dallas Mavericks with Luke and Kyrie. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons they said it was because of the change of pace. Luka plays at a slower pace, Kyrie mm-hmm. plays at a faster pace. Mm-hmm. You get two different paces coming at you at the same time. Yeah. They can be down 20 going into halftime mm-hmm. and they control the pace so much that they end up winning the game. Mm-hmm. Right? So even in that situation with life, right, you controlling the pace or you allow yourself the pace to just do this, you're down, you miss, made some mistakes, made some bad decisions, right? Yeah. We're going to correct it at a halftime. We're going to correct it in the third quarter. We're going to get back to our own game, things that work for us. Mm-hmm. We're going to actually develop and be intentional with our pace. And then we're going to work ourselves back into this. And by the end of the game, we should be have a W. Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. Right? But if not, we still go back to the drawing board. But at the same time, we know we put in every detail we needed to to be uh, put ourselves in a position to win. Yeah. By making the adjustment. And that's the same thing for life. Mm-hmm. We constantly have to be in a state of adjusting and change while also being intentional and present at the same time. And that's very hard to do, but that's life. Mm-hmm. And you're going to always be in it in that same way. What would you say it would take to walk a day in your shoes? <laughs> what would it what what would it take to walk a day in your shoes mm. Mm. I'm not saying all that to say that I'm just this amazing individual and got this going on definitely um it takes a lot of patience and restraint mm-hmm. to walk a day in my shoes and that's even me trying to practice it for myself yep <laughs> Patience, restraint, um, intentionality, um, finding peace in a lot of things that we do. Um, it will take a lot to do that. And there's some things that I don't, I mean, I tell people, like, I don't even engage with. I don't have the energy or time to. You know, so you're going to have to be able to not engage with everything that's coming at the same time while you're trying to move and succeed and take care of this take care of that there's always something to engage with you got the choice to choose to engage with it or not can you handle that yeah a lot of folks can't handle it i, I don't i'm not gonna engage with everything i talk about it i can't i can't afford the time can't afford the the energy <laughs> you know what i'm saying i gotta do what's best for me and my family 
um, in the community that I serve. You know what I'm saying? In whatever community that it is. So, mm-hmm. um, so that's what I would say. Take a lot with the walk in my shoes is what you engage with, um, how you how you look, how you find peace in the small things, um, time, patience, restraint, a lot of prayer. <laughs> yeah, a lot of prayer um, with that. So that's what I would say. What's one piece of advice you would give to somebody looking to? walk adjacent to the path you have in life as a therapist and an educator and a father oh man and first of all first of all I'm gonna say find God just I mean I know everybody has different beliefs but that's been my calling card is my relationship with Jesus and his his the journey that I've walked in that path as being a Christian um that's the first thing and then um, my spouse, my wife, man. <coughs> nah, you know, I mean, my wife has been so supportive and just, you know, we supported each other. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know what path I would went down <laughs> without, without Jesus Christ and my wife. At this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, not to say nothing, nothing, I got amazing friends and relationships. My, my mom and dad are amazing, you know. And, my uncles and my grandparents who were still in part, you know, part my, of me. My boy, you just calling a spade a spade. Yeah, that's all. That's it. But I, I'm, I'm telling you, man. You can read my book. It, my book says the same thing. It's in the book. It's in the book. Refresh the journey book. to find peace, man. You know, Jesus Christ and, and my my wife, man. I think without those two things, um, I don't get to this point in my life um, because I could have easily veered off, mm-hmm. easily went a different way. Yeah. Easily, yeah. easily. So I reflect on. I've been reflecting on that a lot too, man. Just where I'm at right now, um, the privilege, the blessing, the, everything I'm doing right now, where I'm at. Um, being a professor, that's still wild to me. Being called a professor, um, being in my doctoral program, um, writing a book, having two kids, being a husband, um, just you know, just little things we take for granted, like you know, waking up, breathing, and. Um, being mobile, you know, just being grateful, right? And, and that's that's you know, thanks to all thanks to God, you know what I'm saying? And my and my wife as well. But I don't think I I, I don't even know what it would look like without those two things. Yeah, in my life, for sure, for sure. And I, I take that to the grave, you know. So yeah, what makes an everyday shoe an everyday shoe for you? Uh, every oh man, so oh, let's see, let's see. Then we get to conversations. All right. Now, as the older thirty-five-year-old with kids and joints and f- foot pains uh, and 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 stuff like that, I need comfort, right? And so, I think a good everyday shoe is something that has a good good solid sole, is cushioned, and it has support. I just realized, and it's going to sound fine, I almost tweeted this and I tweeted and I deleted it. Just realized, because I used to wear my shoes, mm-hmm. string out, you know, mm-hmm. just hanging, you just walk. That was a cool thing to do with sneakerhead. It was. It was. Can't Loosey do that. goosey. No. Crazy. Tying my shoes up. Why? Crazy. I need stability. Yeah. Right? At my big age, right? Mm-hmm. But. Is this your everyday shoe you're about to put out right here? This is one of my everyday shoes. It's an Air Max One. Mm-hmm. I, I'm late to the Air Max party, but I love Air Max Ones and Air Max 97s mm-hmm. and any type of the basketball Air Maxes. Yeah. But this Air Max One got a big bubble. It's supportive. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's super cushiony. And I got flat feet, so I have no choice but to wear you know, shoes that have some form of cushion or bubble. Now, I'm big on Air Max Ones. I'm almost so big on... New Balances. Mm-hmm. And so right now, my favorite pair of New Balances is, uh, I got 990 V6 and the 993s. Those are my most comfortable shoes. And so that's a good everyday shoe for me. Something that's cushion, balance, give you support, and you can wear all day. If I can wear the shoe all day mm-hmm. without no feet, foot pain, yeah, that's a good everyday shoe. Okay. I can wear these all day. Mm-hmm. Now, I what, can't. 
can't wear these all day. Now, what makes your grail a grail? Um, nostalgia, right? Setting back moments in time. And uh, where were you when you had that, sh when you first laid eyes on that shoe? Can you tell a story about that shoe? Mm -hmm. I could tell a story about all the shoes in my collection, right? Uh, playing today. I could probably, we can do like 20, 25, 35 episodes. Mm -hmm. But it has to, for me, I know everybody's different, right? You like what you like, look, man, not get to the whole conversation. You like what you like, you get what you get, you buy what you buy. Mm -hmm. But for me, my grills are something that, tell a story they are specific to a moment in time and they also can speak to a certain time period in my life um, that resonates with me mm -hmm. right and depending on the colorway depending on the time I'm going to always be able to you know at least allow myself to get to them and have them in my collection and um, they'll be my grails for me some of my grails this is a grail for me that I wore yeah I don't typically wear my grails I don't typically wear my grails. Really? Mm -hmm. I they'll I give them a one, two, three, four. You know, maybe a couple times of, on doing that, but mm -hmm. um, I have been trying to be better about that in wearing my grails. Mm -hmm. um, but typically in the past, I have not worn my grails a lot because they mean something to me, and so I keep them um, close to me or cleaner or. You know, not too much dirt, nothing on. This is a day in my shoe.